Hey guys, in this video we're going to be going over the week 1 concepts for physics 111. Starting off with base units, we can see for instance that the meter is the base unit for length and seconds are the base units for time and so forth. It's just important to familiarize yourself with some of these base units as they'll be used a lot throughout physics. Derived units, as the name suggests, are units which have been derived from the base units. For area, for instance, we could think of a square. In order to find the area of a square, we would multiply length times width, giving us meters times meters, which is meters squared. For volume, we could think of a cube. The volume of a cube can be found by multiplying length times width times height, giving us meters cubed. Density is the amount of mass per volume, so kilograms per meter cubed. And speed is distance per time, so meters per second. Throughout physics, there's going to be a lot of converting between different units. So this is just a quick example of how to convert from 5 miles to centimeters. So we start with our 5 miles. We're going to multiply these by 5,280 feet per mile. Now we know that there are 12 inches in a foot. And similarly, there are 2.54 centimeters in one inch. Now we've canceled out our miles, our feet, and our inches. We're left with centimeters, which is what we were looking for. And the answer ends up being 643,737 centimeters. Now on the top right, we can see a chart that contains the different prefixes that we'll be using uh, throughout the course um, within the metric system. It's really important to familiarize yourself with this, not only the symbols, but also the values for each symbol. Um, it's really useful, for instance, when taking a road trip, you're not going to want to measure the distance you've traveled in centimeters because that unit is just too small, but rather something like kilometers and vice versa. If we're measuring something underneath a microscope, we're not going to be using meters, but something smaller like millimeters or even micrometers. Next, we'll be covering scientific notation, which is just a way of writing numbers in a more concise manner and showing how precise the numbers are. A times 10 to the B is scientific notation, where A is a number between 1 and 10 and B is an integer. So for example, 34,000 written in scientific notation would be 3.4 times 10 to the fourth. 3.4 is a number between 1 and 10, and in order to make 3.4 equal 34,000, we would have to move the decimal over four places to the right. Therefore, we multiply by 10 to the fourth. 23.5 times 10 to the fifth is not in scientific notation because 23.5 is greater than 10. Therefore, if we move the decimal over one spot to the left, we get 2.35, which falls between 1 and 10, and then we'd multiply by 10 to the 6 in order to make up for this decimal movement. Next, we'll be talking about significant figures. And there are three main rules for significant figures, starting off with non-zero digits always being significant, then zeros between two significant digits are also significant, and lastly, a final zero or trailing zero is only significant if it's located within the decimal portion of the number. So for the first example, we have the number 230. Now according to rule 1, 2 and 3 are significant digits, but 0 is not according to rule 3 because it is not located within the decimal portion. So that means we have in the first example two significant digits. In the next example, we have uh, the 2 and 3 again, according to rule 1, will be significant. And the two last zeros behind the decimal point must be significant as well, according to rule 3. And according to rule 2, because the first zero is between two significant digits, it is also significant. Therefore, in this case, we have five significant digits. The third example shows a notation of um, stating that everything to the left of the decimal is significant. Therefore, here we have three significant figures. And in the last example, we use scientific notation. And we know that within scientific notation, whatever is located within the A um, portion of scientific notation will be all the significant figures of the number. So in this case, we only have two significant figures. Next, we'll be talking about how to do math with significant figures. And basically, there are uh, 
two main divisions. So first off, for multiplication and division, the number will be reduced by the least number of significant figures. So it's important to remember that significant figures play a role in multiplication and division. For addition and subtraction, the number will be reduced by the least number of decimal places. So it's important to know that decimal places play a role in addition and subtraction. We have some examples to the right. In the first example, uh, we're doing simple addition. And we know that within addition, we're looking at the least number of decimal places for our final answer. So in this case, um, 89.332 has three digits behind the decimal place, but 1.1 only has one digit. Therefore, our answer must also only have one digit. If we do the math on this, we end up getting 90.432, but because of significant digits, this becomes 90.432. Four. Now in the second example, we're doing multiplication, and we need to remember that with multiplication and division, we will look at the least number of significant figures. So in this case, our first number, 2.8, only has two significant figures, so we know that our answer will only have two significant figures. If we work this out, we'll get, end up getting 12.61092, but by significant figures rules, we know that the answer is going to only be 13 because we only have 2.8 only has two significant figures. Next, we'll be talking about accuracy and precision. Something that's precise uh, determines how close repeated measurements of the same quantity are to each other. And something that's accurate determines how close a measurement is to the actual value. So we have some examples here. In the first uh, picture on the left, we see that there are a lot of um, darts located in one single area, but the area is not the bullseye. Because the values are all close to each other, we know that the uh, value is precise, but it is not at the bullseye, so it is not accurate. Next, we have a picture where all the darts are located at the bullseye, telling us that the values are close to each other, so therefore they are precise and they're at the actual value, making them accurate as well. In the last picture, we have the darts all spread around the dartboard, and none of them are at the bullseye, telling us that the answers are neither accurate nor precise. All right, now we're gonna be covering the difference between scalars and vectors. A scalar is a quantity with only a magnitude, and a vector is a quantity with both magnitude and direction. On the right, we have a couple examples so 300 meters, this is only a magnitude. So we know that this is gonna be a scalar quantity. Next, we're given 235 meters west. So we have both a direction and a magnitude. We know that this is a vector quantity. Next, we're given 400 feet forward. Once again, we have a direction and a magnitude. So this is a vector. Lastly, we're given 20 centimeters. This is only a magnitude. So we know that this is a scalar unit. Next, we'll be talking about the difference between distance and displacement. Distance is the total path length, and it depends on the path taken, while displacement is a straight line distance between two points and the direction. So, for example, if we were to take a road trip and we took this path, the red line would represent our distance because it's the total path length that we took during the road trip. However, our displacement would be the distance from point A to point B in a straight line. So displacement is a change in position. Position we often refer to as x, so therefore displacement is delta x, and it can be found by subtracting the initial position from the final position. So we have a couple examples below. First, we have a cart that starts at xi, so its initial position, and moves to the right in a linear motion and ends at xf. In this case, because we have linear motion in only one direction, we know that the distance will be equal to the displacement because the distance traveled is a straight line from point A to point B, which is the definition of displacement. In the second example, the cart starts moving, then changes direction and moves back towards the left. In this case, our distance is the path length, so it is in black movement we made or in green on the picture and our displacement is going to be the distance between 
the initial and final position. So therefore, our delta x, our displacement is in red, and our distance traveled is in black. All right, lastly, we're gonna be talking about the difference between average speed and average velocity. So for average speed, we take the total distance and divide by the total time, which will give us a scalar quantity and tell us how fast an object is moving. So for example, a toy car travels eight meters along a straight line in four seconds. What is the average speed of the car? So we start off by knowing that speed is distance over time. Our distance was eight meters and our time was four seconds. Therefore, our speed would be two meters per second. Now for average velocity, we take the total displacement and divide by the total time. Displacement is a vector quantity, therefore velocity will also be a vector quantity, meaning it has both a magnitude and a direction. So it'll tell us how fast and in what direction an object is moving. So for example, a race car drives one lap around a circular track with a radius of 100 meters in 20 seconds. What is the car's average speed and average velocity? So speed is distance over time. So in order to find the distance of travel, we know that it's driving in a circular motion. So we're gonna to wanna to find the circumference of the path it took. And circumference equals two pi r. So we would wanna do two pi times 100 meters over 20 seconds, which would give us 31 meters per second. Now in order to find velocity, we're gonna take the displacement and divide by time. Now, if we're driving in a circle, displacement is the final position minus the initial position. So in this case, the final and initial position are the same location. Therefore, our displacement is gonna be zero meters and our time will still be 20 seconds, but this will give us a velocity of zero meters per second. So velocity is not dependent upon the path taken, whereas speed is, therefore we have a speed of 31 meters per second, but because we didn't change position, in the long run, we only have a velocity, an average velocity of zero meters per second. All right, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.